sing this together. Come and consume. Come and consume all we are. Give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. We want you. Come and consume all we are. Give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. Oh, come and consume all we are. Give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. We want you. You walk into everything changes. Darkness starts to tremble at the light. 
worship. We are worshiping and proclaiming from a place of joy and thanksgiving. And sometimes we have to worship so that we can be joyful and have thanksgiving. So wherever you are today, either place, just lift your voice.
How many of you thought I would wear a UT shirt today? Go ball, somebody said. Can we do that in church? Is that legal? I don't know. We do it all the time here, but that's all right. A hey, uh, big wit victory, though, over Auburn. Come on, we get a little, little yeah for that. Morale is up. You guys are energized. I'm going to get some amens today, right? Amen. There we go. We're going to start it out right. Hey, I'm excited. Uh, if you're a guest here, welcome. My name is Derek. I have the privilege and honor of getting to, to be part of this church first and foremost, but also that God has given me the opportunity to lead this incredible body of believers. It's a joy of mine. So if you're new here, first Sunday, welcome. Uh, we try to be pretty simple. Uh, you know, we don't get around a pastor and say, we want to follow a pastor. We want to follow a band. No, we say we want to be in the presence of Jesus. We believe that is where transformation happens. That is where we find hope. That is where we find healing. That is where we find our identity, right? Which is what we all long for. And so that's who we are as a church. And I hope you experience some of that today. Today, we, we are starting to um, into a new series. And the title of this series is entitled simply Risk. Everybody say risk. Yes. Risk. Let's say it one more time with a little gusto. Risk. All right. How many of you, this is kind of a, a scientific uh, question. How many of you are risk takers? Raise your hand. All right. We've got a few of you. Some of you are like, eh. if you can't raise your hand on that question, you're not a risk taker, by the way. <laughs> How many of you are like anti-risk, let's play safe to the vest? Anybody that you're going to take a risk by raising your hand and say, I'm not a risk taker? Yeah. Okay. So we've got a mixture in this room. And so over the next couple weeks, we're going to look at this idea of risk. The stepping out into the unknown, taking a step out into an area that I don't know. And many of us are familiar with risk. If you're a business owner, you guys know oh too well that you know about risk. Is anybody a stock market person? Anybody we got some stock market? Like, yeah, a couple of you. Well, when I got out of college, I was like, you know what? I'm an engineer, right? Engineers can do anything, said in the engineer, right? Nobody else believes it but the engineer. And so I said, I'm going to try my hand at the stock market. And uh, I'm not going to go get an investor. That would make too much sense. So I'm going to invest my own money and I'm going to play the dollar stock game. Anybody like the dollar stock game? Anybody ever tried this? You know, in, in elementary school, we did that thing where you buy a stock hypothetically. And I did really well. And so I'm like, I'm going to do really well in real life. And so, um, so I researched a little bit. I talked to some people and uh, I, I land on this company called West Energy or West Canyon Energy. And I'm like, this is my golden egg. Like this is going to take me to retirement. I'm going to invest some money in this, even though I just graduated college, we don't have a lot of money, but I'm going to take a portion and I'm going to invest. And so I took my money, uh, not a ton of money, but I took some money and I invested in this company because I just knew like this was going to skyrocket. They were going to tap into some unknown resource somewhere in the world and it was going to blow up and it was just going to be like Beverly Hillbillies all over again. That's what it was going to be like. <laughs> And so I did that. And, and last night I, I Googled West Canyon Energy. You can look it up if you want. It's a real company. And, um, and I looked it up last night. And the value of that company today, um, how many years? 10 years later, 11 years later, is, brace yourself, point. <laughs> it's never a good thing when you start out that. Point, zero, zero, six, five, five. Wow. Six tenths of a cent. Was that a good risk? Anybody know? Was that a good risk? Horrible risk. And guess what? Mama won't let me do anymore. Buy stocks. Got somebody that's paid for that, right? That's a risk. And so I don't want to talk about that kind of risk, though. Like we, got, we got people that know that. That is not my line of business. That's not what God has ordained me and given me identity to do. Today, I, I want to talk about what does it look like to take a kingdom risk, a risk where I hear God lead me to something and I actually step out and obey him. That is the risk that I want to look at over the next couple weeks. Now, now the risk uh, that we're talking about is one that is not a one-time thing when we're talking about following Jesus. It is a lifestyle. Risk is the lifestyle of a follower of Jesus. And you say, well, what about that? Well, here's some of the things Jesus said. He says, listen, if you want to gain your life, you got to lose it. That's a huge risk. You mean I got to give all my life in order to gain life, talk about putting the whole house on the table. Risk. He said things like, love your enemy. Oh, I don't know if you've ever done that, but that's huge risk. Like, what if they don't love me back? Jesus said, yeah, it's a good chance. That's not going to happen. Risk. 
Or he said, listen, there's going to be signs and wonders and miracles and healings follow those that believe in Jesus. Listen, I'm going to tell you, if you step out and pray for God to move, it's going to require a risk. Anybody else ever been there, right? It's going to require a risk. And so the lifestyle of a believer is one of risk. Why? Because risk is an expression of faith. And apart from faith, it's impossible to please God. That's what the Hebrews 11 says. Why? Because with faith, we depend on God. And we depend on God in relationship with God, which is what God wants in the beginning with, right? And so I want to talk about risk. And today I want to go to an Old Testament story. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and pull it out. Pull open your phone, wherever you got. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis, first book of your Bible, all the way to the left. Genesis chapter 22. I want to look at a guy that's, that's really the father of faith, a guy named Abraham. So we're going to be in 22, but let me give you a little background up to that point. So in chapter 12 of Genesis, we meet a guy named Abram for the first time, whose name was literally changed later to Abraham, originally Abram. We meet him in chapter 12, and God comes to Abram and says, listen, Abram, I want you to leave your hometown, the place that you've grown up in, the place where you know everybody, the place where you got families and friends and you got your small group that you've been with. I want you to leave that hometown and I want you to go to a place that I will show you in the future. That sounds like a risk, doesn't it? Wait, God, like you you want me to leave what I know today, where I'm comfortable, where I got everything worked out, I know my way to work, where I can cut all the corners and I can beat, you know, my my maps time, I can beat that time because of, you want me to leave that time and you want me to go somewhere, but you're not even telling me where to go? Yeah, Abraham, that's what I'm asking you to do. I want you to take a risk. I want you to follow me. This is where we first meet Abraham in, in a risk. God says, will you follow me? And I'm not even going to tell you where we're going. Because if I told you, Abraham, where we're going, you wouldn't believe me. And if you did, it would blow your mind. So I'm just asking you, will you, will you follow me? That's what we find in chapter 12. Now, in chapter 12, we see that he gets this word and he actually does it. Now, let me just tell you, when Abraham first is introduced in the scriptures and he hears God say, leave your hometown, he's 75 years old. Now, one of the things I loved about this church when we were um, being interviewed and looking at, I love the fact that this church has a cross section of ages in our church. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I love it. Like we've got young people coming here every week. We've got new young adults coming every week. And I love that. Vibrancy, life, right? And, and then we got an incredible group of, of, I won't call you middle-aged, but you're in between two age groups. How's that sound? And y'all are incredible. Like, y'all are showing up, y'all teaching, y'all incredible. You got a little bit more time in your hands because your kids aren't so little, and so you're doing amazing things. And then we've got this another group, this what we call prime timers. We got any prime timers in the house this morning, by the way? We got a couple of you raising your hand. Um, you got this prime timer group, which is the 55 plus. And so here, here, I just want to speak to you. If, you. if you consider yourself in that age group, I want to first off, I want you to know that we value you as a church. I want you to hear that from your pastor. We value you. But I want to challenge you that God's risk-taking that he's called us to, it does not have a stopping age. Nowhere in the scriptures will you find, hey, get to 58 Cash out your retirement and go and settle down and just be comfortable. Nowhere in the scriptures will you find that. Now, listen, I'm not against 401ks. I'm not against retirement plans. I'm not against life insurance. I'm not against any of that. What I'm against, though, is us checking down to be comfortable instead of obeying God. And I want to challenge you, if you're in that age group, God is not done with you yet. You are here for a purpose. And we, as the younger generation, we need to see you living life. We need to see you risking it all for the name of Jesus. We need you to be risk takers. We need you to be. And so this message is not just for the younger generation. It's also for those that find yourself in the last season of life. Just like Abraham, 75 years old. And he says, listen, sell that house that you just paid off and move to a place where I'm going to show you. So this is what we see in Abraham. Then he goes to Abraham and says, listen, Abraham, I'm going to give you some descendants. And they're going to be numbered like the stars in the sky. So many of them. And he's like, listen, God, real quick, um, I'm 75 and I don't have any kids yet. So I'm not saying this over your 75-year-olds that you're going to have a baby. Like, you're like, nope, don't, I'm not receiving that. Like, we're not doing that. That's not what I'm talking about. But Abraham, this is what the lane God had for him. God, I, I'm, I'm past my prime of, of having babies. And my, my wife, you know, I'm not going to call her old, but... 
she's not really in childbirth in years. Once again, am I going to trust God? He, he had to take a risk. Am I going to, am I going to listen to God? Or am I going to trust him? The story unfolds where he actually does trust God and God gives him, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, a baby. They're about 100 years old. You're like, once again, don't put that on me. But it worked for them because Abraham actually lived to be 175. So if you look at percentage of life, he was right in line with everything. But but his life was marked with taking risk, taking risk and hearing God and obeying God. And now we're going to be in Acts chapter 22. And so to this point, God has fulfilled his promise uh, the, the desire of, of Abraham's heart was to have a son. God fulfills that through his wife, Sarah, and they called him Isaac. And what we see here in chapter 22 is a story that maybe some of us have heard, but I want to take a, a little different look on it and look at it through the eyes of risk taken and then take some application of what's that look like for you and me. So at the beginning of this verse, so all these things have happened. God's given them provision. He's moving them around. He's given them a son, fulfilled a promise, blew their minds. And so now it says, after all these things, God tested Abraham. Did you know that God tests people? What God does not do is he does not tease people and he does not tempt people. So make that clear. But God will test people, okay? So maybe today you're going through a tough time in life. You're feeling the pressure of things. It may or may not be from the enemy. It may be God inviting you to something more because when he tests us, there's always a purpose. When God tests us, listen, it is a season of preparation. He's preparing us for what he wants to do in us and through us. And so when God tests us, he is preparing us. And I'll tell you the two ways that I most often experience the test of God. It's to reveal some pride in my life, which I know none of y'all struggle with that. He reveals some pride in my life. He puts me through a testing time where I realize that Derek can't do it on my own. It's his grace that he would allow me to do that because I don't want to run down a path that depends on Derek. I want to depend on God. And so in his testing, sometimes he revealed to me areas of my life where I've just been checking down to what can Derek do. But also what I think God does, and it's so beautiful and so gracious that he also tests us to reveal what he already knows about us to ourselves. Like when he sees us, he already sees who we are. He already sees what's inside of us. And sometimes he tests us so that we can learn how he already made us. Anybody else understand that? Like it's actually to build up our, our own faith oftentimes. And so we see that Abraham is being tested by God and, and God calls out, Abraham, yo, Abe, Abe. And Abraham says, here I am. And, and God says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Once again, we hear, go somewhere. And I'm not even going to tell you where, though. We see that same theme in God here. Go to a mountain that I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Now here's what we see. The first thing I want you to write down in your notes is that God, or that God requires us to risk to follow him. Or you could say that following God requires risk, it requires stepping into the unknown, stepping into the uncomfortable. This is the normal lifestyle you would expect if we are going to follow God. This is what Abraham sees. Now, when we read this story, we're like, that sounds so outlandish to think that God would go to a man and say, hey, will you sacrifice your baby? Anybody else think that's just crazy talk? I hope so, right? Now, you got to remember that God meets us in our current understanding every time. The culture's totally different. Like what's acceptable today was totally different than what was acceptable then. Now at this time when God is forming a people that's going to be called Israel and the Jews, when he's forming them, he is stepping into a pagan society. And this pagan society had many gods and oftentimes those gods, what they would say, little g gods, they required a sacrifice to appease them or to please them. And oftentimes that sacrifice would be a little baby. This is just the reality of the culture that God is meeting Abraham in. Abraham would have understood that many of the gods that others served required a baby to be sacrificed. And so God steps into that culture so that Abraham would understand. He says, Abraham, I, I want you to take your son, your only son, the one that I promised you, the one that I fulfilled my promise to you. I want you to take him and I want you to, to offer him up as a sacrifice. So Abraham heard God and then he actually stepped out and obeyed God. 
He took a risk, right? This is what we see in Abraham's life. Verse 5, it says, But Abraham said to his young men, his servants, he said, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you again. I and the boy, we're going to go over and worship. And so this word worship, we're going to talk about in two weeks, this idea of worship and, and what it looks like to risk and worship. But, but what that word means in the Old Testament, it means to prostrate yourself. Um, it means to get down before God and to humble yourself and to get down before him to ascribe much worth to who he is. It's actually a physical posture of a spiritual reality. That's what we see in the Old Testament, right? Worship. And so I'm going to go worship in the midst of this unknown. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you feel like you're in a season of testing, there is not a greater thing that you can do to worship. To humble yourself before God and say, God, you're worthy. I don't understand this. I don't get it. I'm actually feeling a lot of inner like, conflict here. But I'm going to trust you and I'm going to worship you because you're worthy of it. This is what Abraham does. Now he gets the boy, they come back, he gets the boy, he gets the wood, he's got fire in his hand and they're walking up the mountain and the boy's like looking around, he's like, oh, we got wood? We got fire. Hey dad, where's the, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, don't worry about it, God will provide. Don't you love that? God will provide. And so then we get a little further in the story and verse nine, it says, when he and the boy came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order, in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Same thing he said in the beginning of 22. He knew God's voice. He said, here I am. And the voice from heaven said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you are not, you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, the Lord will provide. Here's the second thing I want you to write down in your notes. And, and this is so important to live out a lifestyle of risk that we must continue to listen as we obey God. We got to get this. We got to listen, continue to listen, even as we obey God. So I don't know about you, but my tendency is I get marching orders, whether that's from my boss or whether that's from God himself. And what do I do? I go to carry it out. And what I oftentimes do is I separate myself from the active voice of God because I'm doing the will of God, right? And I kind of separate myself from God, which is not his desire, right? As we obey God, we got to keep our ears and our eyes on him. See, Abraham, he heard God, go sacrifice your son. What if he would have stopped listening? What if he would have stopped listening? He, he's carrying out the will of God. God said, go sacrifice the son. If he would have done that and stopped listening, he would have killed his son. And it would not be Abraham Isaac. It, it would be Abraham fill in the blank, somebody else's name. But because Abraham listened to God, obeyed God, and continued to listen to God, things changed dramatically. Things changed dramatically. And I was trying to think about how do I describe this in a way that will relate to it. And so I was thinking about football. Uh, yeah, like, I don't know how that works. It just happens. And um, so in, in a huddle, right, you got a huddle, especially college and NFL, uh, a play comes in and everybody's in a huddle. And then the quarterback says, ready, break. And what do we do at break? We all clap. So let's just wake up. When I say ready, we're going to say break together and we're going to clap our hands, right? Just get some energy flowing in the room. Ready, break. All right, a little bit better. You guys are trying out for the football team. Come on. Ready, break. All right, that's beautiful. That's good. So this is what happens. The quarterback calls a player. They say, ready, break. Oh, some of you got it. You get it. Um, and then everybody runs out to their positions, right? Now, in this moment, what has happened? They have heard, I have heard what the play is and what is supposed to happen in my role. So I played receiver in college, and so I run out to my receiver position. And I know what play I'm supposed to run. I know that I'm supposed to run an 18-yard comeback towards the sideline. It's going to be an amazing comeback. It's going to be so beautiful. And, uh, and so I get out there. And as I'm standing there, the quarterback's here. When I'm out there, I'm thinking about the play, but I'm also looking at the defense. And I'm surveying the defense and trying to figure out what, what kind of defense are they running. It's called a, a pre-snap read. 
And so maybe in this scenario, I see a one high safety playing over the top and everybody else is in man to man. So that's called cover one. You can take notes later if you need to. Cover one defense, one high safety and, uh, and everybody else is in man to man. So I said, okay, I know I'm supposed to run my route. I'm supposed to run the 18 yard comeback, put a foot in the ground and come back and catch the ball. This is what I'm supposed to do. But as soon as the snap takes place, the defense changes their scheme. And not only is it one safety, now they switch to two safety, which is called cover two. There's a remedial class later, by the way. So cover two defense, which is now a zone defense, totally changes the game. Now the corner is not man to man. He's actually going to sit in the zone here. And so when that happens, come back, come back, come back. As I'm running and I see the safety go high, I realize in that moment, the play that was called has to be changed. Because if I run that comeback and I run it the way I should, that safety is going to be underneath it and he's probably going to intercept it. So in my training... Even though I heard the call in the huddle, as I'm running, I'm still being aware of the defense. And as I'm running, I'm actually adjusting my route on the fly, me and the quarterback. And I actually run a corner route, so I take that safety out so the tight end can get the dig over the middle. Amen to that, right? See, what are we talking about here, right? If I would have ran the same play that I was told to run in the huddle, it would have ended really bad. But I need to continue my awareness even as I'm running the play and adjust as I go. This is what God's called us to. To live a life of risk means I hear God, but I don't ever hear God and just run forward and depend on Derek to do everything. No, I keep asking God and keep seeking God. Same thing is, my wife and I, we heard clearly, go to Kingsport, go and be the lead pastor. How many of you do, do you want me to be your pastor and me stop listening to God? Anybody? Ain't going to happen, right? I'm listening to God. I'm obeying God. But as I am, I'm still saying, God, what are you doing? What do you want me to know? And willing to adjust on the fly. This is what happened to Abraham. He adjusted to the voice of God that was present. We've got to be attuned not only to what God has said, to what God is saying. That's what we see in Abraham's life. And he obeyed God and he continued to listen to God throughout. And because of that, Isaac lived. Isaac lived. Now, if we go down a few more verses here, uh, verse 17, this is what God says to, to Abraham. He says, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashores. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because, why? You have obeyed my voice. If you have your Bible, I want you to underline that. Why was God going to bless Abraham? Because he obeyed the voice of the Lord. Let me tell you this. It's the last point that I want you to write down today. Is that the blessing of God is not found in just hearing him, but in obeying him. The blessings of God are not found in simply hearing God, but actually in aligning your life and obeying him. This is where we see the blessing of God. And here's the reality. You know this if you have kids. Listen, my wife and I will tell you, we've been in a tough season as parents. We've had a lot of transition going on and it's been tough. And so this is what I know. I I sit down with my kids and I say, guys, guys, listen, listen to me. Anybody else ever think if you talk loud and slow, they're going to listen? Yeah. Here, I know you can hear me because I've had your hearing checked. Listen to me. You will be more blessed if you obey me. Anybody else ever had that conversation with your, with your kids? And I'm like, you will be blessed. If you do not obey me, I will have to withhold my blessing. This is how I talk in my house. It's a little weird. What am I teaching my kids? It's not just in hearing daddy's voice that brings a blessing, but it's when you hear my voice and you choose, you choose to align with my voice is where you're going to receive the blessing. And it's true for our relationship with our father as well. And he said, Derek, well, what about these spiritual blessings that I have in Ephesians chapter two, I think two or three. And I would say, yeah, you're right. In the spiritual realm, we have every spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing is already ours. But obedience is what makes it reality here on this earth, right? Like I know that I'm forgiven. All those things, God's love is never questionable. But the obedience alignment with him is where I experience the blessing of God on this earth as it is in heaven. 
This is not a, a speech on legalism whatsoever. Man, not at all. But what I know is that Jesus lived a line with the Father and I want to live a line with the Father as well. And I know that his blessing flows through those that choose to align with him. Now, this is not just an Old Testament thought. This is also in the New Testament. James chapter 1, verse 22. I'm going to read it from the screen here. He says, this is what James writes to the 12 tribes that have been dispersed. The believers, he says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Right? Doesn't that sound familiar? I'm going to bless you for your obedience. His scripture says right here, you're going to be blessed in your obedience here. This is what we see in the scripture. It's not just hearing God, but obeying God and taking a risk that changes the game where we experience the things of God on this earth and not just waiting for eternity. Now, how does that look? How do we do that? How do we begin to take risk as people? And, and here's kind of the, the, the flow of it. Here's the first thing we got to do if we want to be a people of risk taking. We got to ask God. God, what do you want me to know? What do you, what do you want me to do? I'm heading into work. I'm walking into my work. I'm walking to Eastman. I'm walking to my school. I'm walking to my business. What do you want me to know about today? This is the pattern of relationship and conversation we want to have with God. God, what do you want me to know? Is there anybody you want me to talk to today? And so this, this looks really simple. Actually, my wife and I, we were headed to a double date on Friday. We were driving in my truck on 11W, and I just looked over and said, hey, babe, what if God wants to use us tonight to do something in this pe these people's life? Or what if he wants to teach us something in this conversation that we wouldn't just go through it and not think anything that God actually cares about? It? What if? And, and we actually had a moment where we just rested ourselves before God and said, God, is there anything you want us to know? Right? What if that was our lifestyle where we just ask God? And then as we ask God, then we, we, we listen to God, Right? We, we give some space for him to actually respond and to speak to us in our lives. But how many of you know asking God and listening to God does not equal risk, right? It does not equal risk. Because when we ask and when we hear, we then actually got to do it. We got to take a step of faith, the unknown, where we actually align our lives with what we feel like God is leading us to. And that's where risk comes in. This is what we do if we're going to be followers of Jesus. We always are asking God, what are you doing? As we hear it, then we step out and take a risk and align with what he's doing. And then after the risk, this is what we do. And we get in trouble all the time because we start beating ourselves up and say, I mean, I messed that up. Or this person didn't respond the way I thought they would. This is what we do after we take the risk. God, what do you want me to know about that risk? It didn't turn out the way I thought it would, but God, what do you say about it? Now, when we're thinking about this concept of this flow and we're thinking about Abraham, we're like, man, like I'm not ready to take that big of risk, Derek. And I'm saying, that's great. You're probably not ready to take that big of risk, but can you take a minor, a minor little risk? Can you take a little step of risk? Because this is what I know about the scriptures, what I know about God himself, that minor obedience leads to major breakthrough. And so don't let, leave here today and think, well, I'm not going to take that kind of risk. I'm just asking you, what if we took one little baby step today? And here's what I want to do as we close before we sing this last song, Yesterday and Men. I want us to take a moment together to just ask God about the rest of the day. Sounds pretty biblical to me. Some of us are going to go to lunch. Some of us are going to go to a football watch party. Some of us are going to go home. Some of us are going to go to another event. I don't know what you're doing today. But what if God was already doing something where you're going? And today we would have an boldness to ask him, humility to receive what he has to say. And then we'd step out to actually see God do something through our lives. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray. This is not anything crazy. I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads and would invite you to pray with me just to ask the Lord about the rest of your day. And I would encourage you to do this daily. Do this several times a day. You're heading into a meeting. Just ask God, God, what do you want me to know? Do you want me to say anything? Do you want me to just be quiet today? What do you want me to know? And what we find is that God is so interested in what's going on in our lives. He speaks way more than we realize. Father, right now, we just recognize that you still speak, that you've never stopped speaking, that you meet us in all kinds of different ways. We just quiet the lies of the enemy right now with the authority you've given us. 
We align our mind with the mind of Christ. Redeem our imagination, Lord. Redeem our ears. So Father, listen, there's so many people in this room. Every one of us is probably going a different direction after this. And so Lord, I just ask, and I would just ask you even to ask the Lord, God, what do you want me to know about the rest of the day? God, is there anybody you want me to talk to? Anybody you want me to send a text to? God, what do you want me to know about today? And what do you want me to do? These are the questions we want to be asking all the time. Lord, I thank you that you meet us when we step out in faith, that it pleases you. And that your grace is sufficient when we step out and it didn't work out so well, your grace is still there. I love that. Lord, I pray that you would increase our courage, our boldness, our humility, that we would step out to align with you, to obey your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing this last song together.